Hi folks, welcome to this video on group dynamics. So again, this is part of the sports psychology aspect of the A-level course. Um, there's quite a few things on here, so please you know, use this video just to fast forward, rewind, replay the topics that you want to go over. But I'm going to go over them all, all the aspects of group dynamics in one video. So what we've got here, first and foremost, are the key stages of uh, group formation. So when a team comes together, regardless of who that team is, be it a relay team or a cricket team, or a football team, or a hockey team, they all go through the same stages of formation. And they fortunately rhyme, or unfortunately rhyme, forming, storming, norming, performing, because you've got to get them in the right order. Okay, you might be asked for the second and third stages, so you need to know which are which. So let's look at what these stages actually mean. So forming, the group comes together for the first time. So often, you know, when you've started a new team from scratch, that's quite a rare scenario. But when your team has signed new players, you're going to go back to the forming stage. So when you've had the mid-season transfer window, or you've bought, you know, you've uh, bought players at the uh, just prior to the start of the new season, or maybe some players have retired and or had injuries, and you've had to replace them. So whenever new recruits come into your team, we call that the forming stage. Following that, you're going to go into the storming phase. Now, this is where some natural conflict is going to take place. As these new recruits join, there's going to be a fight for certain, not a natural physical fight, hopefully, but a fight for roles and positions. Who's, you know, someone's been signed who also plays your position. That's going to lead to conflict because now your place in the team, your squad in the squad is under, is under threat. So the, the aim of a coach there is to get through the conflict stage or get his or her team through the conflict stage as quickly as possible. Once your coach or leader's got you through the storming phase, you'll then hopefully be in the norming phase where you get some agreement, some stability, and you start to cooperate. So, you know, the conflict has calmed down. And, you, you know, it's called norming because everything is hopefully now going to get normal. And then finally, once that occurs, we hopefully get our team into the performance stage. And this is where we're going to start producing some high quality performances and we're going to begin to achieve. So the point is every group goes through these. You want to get through to the performing stage as quickly and effectively as possible. But you've got to go through all four stages. It's just a natural occurrence that takes place. And every time you sign new players or new members join your group, they set you back towards the forming stage. And you've got to work back through to the performing stage. So, you know, you, sometimes when you see teams that have got some really excellent players, spent a lot of money on their squads... And they're just not knitting together. You know, the reason is because is they have not got through to the performance stage for whatever reason. They're stuck maybe in the storming phase or the norming phase and they're just not working together. Okay, so they're the stages of group formation. So a potential reason why we might not be or might not get to the performance stage is due to a lack of cohesion. Okay, now cohesion, what can we say about it? If something is cohesive, it sticks. So how well does the team or how well do our players stick together that is cohesion obviously successful teams have high cohesion less successful teams have lower levels of cohesion okay so you know what is one of the key factors that affects cohesion well as you'd expect we mentioned it before depends on our leaders on how good or how high or how effective our cohesion is okay now, as you can probably tell, there are two types of cohesion. So let's have a look at each of those in turn. So task cohesion is all about the task. How willing are we to work towards a shared goal? Okay, so has your team got a set goal and how well is everyone pulling in that same direction? That is your task cohesion. And in contrast to that, the social cohesion is the ability of the group to get on with each other. So how you know how well they get on the social aspect. Um, now, here's the thing. If you could only have one, you'd want task. Task, you know, is greater than social cohesion. So task is more important to team success than social cohesion, okay? There's a lot of anecdotal stories about, you know, the Manchester United treble winning team where they had a strike partnership of Andy Cole and Teddy Sheringham. Now, those apparently, those two players didn't like each other, didn't get on well with each other, okay? They weren't, they were, what, say they weren't great friends, they weren't, they weren't friends at all. Yet, so their social cohesion was very low, yet they were the most successful strike partnership in English football 
in terms of winning the treble, the FA Cup, the Premier League and the Champions League. And they set each other up and scored lots of goals between them. So they obviously had very high task cohesion, but very low social cohesion. The key thing is, you know, what would you, you know, you want them both. So how could you increase each of these? Well, two key ways to increase task cohesion. Number one, set a team goal, set a smart target that everyone's going to aim towards. But also, if you increase social cohesion, you should also increase task cohesion. If I get the, my team that's liking each other, okay, and, you know, working well with each other, that will ultimately lead to higher task cohesion, okay? But how can we improve social cohesion? Well, things like team building, uh, team building camp, sorry, and room sharing. So when, you know, you're going away and playing an away fixture, don't have a hotel room each, get two or three of them in a room together, okay? So there's, uh, you know, they get to know each other on a social level, which will hopefully boost task cohesion as well. I'll just come back finally just to this point here about tasks being more important than social. The issue is social, you can get things like cliques. You know, then three or four players that gossip with each other. Sorry, that dot's in the wrong place. Three or four players that gossip with each other and chat and the, the rest of the team feel like, uh, you know, they're trying to be separate to us. Straight away, you've got low social cohesion when that occurs. So, you know, you've got to try and disrupt the formation of cliques within your group. Okay, so next then, the psychologist Karen said that there were four antecedents, four antecedents, however you want to pronounce it, also known as four factors. I'm not a very intelligent person to ask that were factors. Um, you know, that affect, and it comes back to what we've just mentioned in the previous slide, that affects cohesion. So, so Karen identified these four factors. So basically, what are they all about? Well, within the environmental factor, there are various things that can affect cohesion. So the size of the group, okay? If there's a big group, you know, you can argue pros and cons. There's more likely that you're going to find someone that you like, but also people that you dislike, okay? But equally, if you've got a small group and you don't like someone, it's going to be a bigger problem. So the size of the group can affect your cohesion. The experience levels in those groups could affect the cohesion as well. Are you all of similar experience levels? Are there some novices in there mixing with some experience? Linked in with that, I suppose, you know, is age. You know, different ages have different mentalities which can affect, you know, the environment and therefore the cohesion. And something that's quoted quite a lot, you want to avoid a star system. So I've written star system on there, but you want to avoid it. Star system means favouritism. So you don't you as the leader or the coach don't want to have obvious favourites within that group because that's going to lead to a star system. You've put people who you idolise there, and the other people feel automatically left out or hard done by. So those they, those factors can all affect um, cohesion, according to Karen. Well, the team factors then, what are the task that your team is facing that can affect cohesion? Is it challenging, in which case they might all pull in the right direction, the same direction, or is it too easy or too difficult, in which case they might all just decide, oh, well, what's the point in working towards this? Okay, and that, you know, mixed in with that is their ability level. Okay, are they capable of meeting the demands of the task? If they are, they might work hard for and with each other to achieve the goals. If they don't think they're capable of achieving it, then... I think you're effectively going to lose the cohesion within the group. So those are the team factors. So in terms of the leadership, now remember leadership can be managers, it can be captains, it can be dominant people within the group. So what are the dominant leadership styles like? Okay, does it is it met with agreement by the rest of the group? But the relationship with the group, we've all heard those phrases, haven't we? Or the manager or the coach has lost the changing room or the locker room, i.e., They've lost the trust and the respect of the players. When that happens, you've got zero cohesion. The players are not going to play for you. So, you know, if it's good and the strong and the style is liked by the team members, you're going to have high cohesion. If the style isn't liked by team members and they've got a poor relationship, you're going to have low levels of cohesion. And then the final factor that's um, going to affect uh, group cohesion, according to Karen, a personal factors, so things like your individual satisfaction levels. You've just signed for a team, but then you've been put on the bench all the time, so your satisfaction is going to be low. You join that team to make a difference, to have an impact. Or, you know, it could go the other way. You're playing a dominant role in this team and things are going well, so you're going to have high satisfaction that lead to high levels of cohesion with the rest of the team. And that's going to, you know, be affected or affect your motivation levels. 
Okay, your desire to want to play hard and play well for your team, that's going to have a direct influence on your cohesion. So they're the four factors that Karen said affect cohesion and affect group dynamics. So our penultimate little topic in terms of group dynamics is something called Steiner's model. So another psychologist, Steiner, wanted to put aspects of group dynamics into a basic equation, which is the one we've got there below. So actual productivity equals potential productivity minus coordination losses. So what does that basically mean? Okay, so actual productivity is basically your actual performance. The performance that you deliver this weekend, tonight, whenever it is you're competing, the actual performance that your team, your group provides. Okay, your potential productivity is how good could you be? So if everyone was fit, everything went perfect, everything was great, the tactics and the set pieces and whatever else worked to perfection, that is your potential productivity, how good you could be. But then, obviously, we have coordination problems. We have issues, okay? Now, those coordination problems uh, can also be called faulty processes. Now, it can be things like poor tactics, okay? Poor teamwork, okay? It can be, you know, things like loss of confidence, a lot of teams out there now in a lot of leagues underperforming uh, due to a bad run of results. You know, they're not, you know, look at some teams where their squad sizes, you know, as I'm doing this video now, Leicester City are top of the Premier League in England with a squad that is, a, or a team that costs about 25 million. Whereas the likes of Chelsea and Man United are way down the league where the squads have cost five, six, seven, eight, even probably even 10 times that amount for their, you know, their starting 11. So they're obviously those teams are not fulfilling their potential productivity because they've got too many coordination problems. So their actual productivity, their actual performances week in, week out are very, very poor. Okay. So, but equally the Leicester City, their potential isn't as great as Chelsea or Man U, but they've obviously got very few coordination problems. So there's a large figure a small figure being taken away from it, it's leading to a very high actual productivity rating or score, if you want to think of it like that. So that's what Steiner said uh, about group dynamics and how to think of how well a team performs. So one of the final topics we're going to look at in terms of um, group dynamics is social loafing and the Ringelman effect. Now, I'll put these two pictures on here because there's a little question that you might want to think about. Okay, you've got Two ladies, they're rowing and four down here. How long does it take these four to row an Olympic distance of 2,000 metres compared to these two? Well, you'd expect half the amount of time for a group of four than it does for a pair because there's twice the muscle power, okay? The answer is there is actually very little difference, okay? Let's say these ladies were to do an Olympic um, rowing course of two in about eight minutes. It'd take the ladies about the four ladies about six. So there's only a couple of minutes difference, and it's due to this thing called social loafing. Now, what does social loafing mean? Basically, when in a group, individual effort levels drop or decrease. So as soon as you put yourself into a group, your individual effort level will drop. Even though, hand on your heart, you are working as flat out as you can. You honestly feel like you are, you're not lying, you're not deceiving anyone. It seems to be a subconscious thing. We reduce our individual effort levels. So as a performer, we effectively hide behind our teammates, okay, or hide within the team. But the problem is we all do it. So that reduces, you know, that, that massively reduces the effort levels of the, the team as a whole, okay? And there's one other thing associated with this, the Ringelman effect, which we've also got titled at the top. So the Ringelman effect basically says Performance and cohesion decreases as the group size increases. In other words, there's no cutoff. As you continue to increase members of that group, individual effort levels will continue to drop. There won't be a bottom limit. Okay? So if one person is putting in 100% effort, 
put them as a duo, they'll each put 80% effort in. Put them as a four, they'll each put 70% effort in. Put them as part of an eight, they'll each put 60% effort in. So as you increase the group size, the individual effort levels continue to fall. Okay, and that is known as the Ringelman effect. Okay, so with all this in mind, what we're going to do finally now is look at what we can do to reduce the negative effects of uh, some of these issues. And in other words, how can we maximise group performance and group dynamics? Now, some of these are going to be general, but some of them are going to be definitely related to some of the theories that we've put on there. And I'll make sure I point that out. Uh, where it's appropriate but some of these as I said are quite general so let's start with one of those I mean that one's fairly common sense we need to make sure our team practices to ensure that we all have a firm understanding of our tactics right these three here are very good ways to reduce social loafing that topic we've just spoken about then I'm just going to quickly put that in there as a little reminder that these three are about trying to reduce the effects of social loafing. Remember, social loafing is hiding behind others in the team. So if I give everyone an individual goal, and I give everyone a specific role in the team, and I emphasise the fact that I'm going to be doing some individual player statistics in this game, then straight away that's going to reduce the effects of social loafing because players now know that even though it is a team, I have individual roles, I have individual responsibilities, I'm being analysed as an individual, so I best make sure that I work as hard as I possibly can. So they're quite good strategies for reducing the effects of social loafing and the Ringelman effect. These ones here, oops a daisy, I'm in the right place, these ones here are all to do with task and social cohesion. Okay. If I set a clear team goal, we immediately have task cohesion. We all know what we need to do. If I'm getting my teammates to encourage one another, I get some peer support, I'm going to boost social cohesion. If I take over on team bonding exercises, that's going to improve social cohesion. And if I, as a leader and a captain, break down any cliques, separate those people who are always nattering to each other and moaning to each other and get them talking with other people, that is also going to boost social cohesion. And as we said earlier, if you increase social cohesion, that automatically has an impact on improving task cohesion, okay? If I also limit change, okay, that is not going to send me back to the forming and storming phase. I'm going to keep my team in the norming and performing. Don't get me wrong, we all need to refresh the team and we all need to bring in new players, but where necessary and where it's appropriate, don't just buy players for the sake of buying players. So you reduce the impact of going back to the forming and storming uh, phase of our group formation. And finally then, these, I mean you could call them general, but I suppose you could link these with Karens if you needed to. Okay. If we get a group identity, we get a kit, you know, logos, all thing, all wearing the same stuff, that's going to improve those team factors that Karen spoke about. We have a clear identity. If I increase the self-efficacy, the self-confidence members of the group, that's going to have a good thing on my personal or member satisfaction. They're going to be more motivated. Also, if I improve the fitness levels, again, that's improving our ability. Okay, so again, the team factors have also been improved there. So, you know, a lot of it's common sense. It's just making sure we apply it in the right way. So hopefully that's been of use to you folks. And this has been a bit of a long one. You know, use the bits as you see fit. And uh, uh, I hope this aids in your revision. Good luck with it all.